am? Right. Okay, cool. Great, so continuing on with this theme, uh, Lynn has been a part of my life since 1979 in person, where I first ran into her at the second International Mars Colloquium in Pasadena, and um, she was the only other woman there. And I was still an undergraduate, and I walked into the ladies' room and there she was, and of course I already knew who she was because I'd already read some of her papers. And I was um, very shy. And she turned to me and there was this gigantic blast of talk. <laughs> and um, she drew me right in. And then she washed her hands in a flurry of dust and ran out back into the hall in the Lynn-like way that we all know. And I was just stunned because this was at a time where it was not easy to be a young woman uh, trying to get into science. And here I had actually been in the ladies' room with a famous one. <laughs> and that probably was a, a signatory change in, in uh, my life. Um, shortly after that, uh, within a year, essentially, I was one of the first cohorts of the Planetary Biology Internship. And that made a gigantic impact on my life and, of course, um, I participated in several, several other summer things that uh, Lynn was uh, instrumental in putting together and conducting. And so, of course, uh, she is one of my dear friends and mentors and beloved ones. So I'm delighted to be able to talk about her, but I certainly wish she were here with us. Um, her broad-ranging intellect, of course, gave me more courage than I uh, would otherwise have had to really go in the multiple directions that my brain naturally wants to pursue. And one of those, of course, is um, astrobiology and planetary science on the broad scale. Uh, but what I do on a daily basis in the lab and in the field is work with the very tiny. And of course, she is the quintessential model for that. So as I was putting this talk together a couple of days ago, I thought, well, what has she taught me? I mean, the list is very long, but these are really the essential things that really pervade what people have said today. This first item, symbiosis, is a pervasive process that really permeates the biosphere at every level, and I see this over and over and over again. Whether I'm looking at uh, microbes in my caves that refuse to grow happily apart, and only conduct the exotic uh, geochemical reactions that they uh, are happy to do when they're in a symphonic ensemble, um, all the way to really looking at the way the biosphere interacts with the geosphere. And so, of course, that has um, pervaded my thinking, really, um, all of my career, and that is directly attributable to Lynn. And the other thing about Lynn was that um, you just couldn't talk her out of it. If she had observed it, she knew it. And that requires a certain amount of courage that is really way beyond me. And so being able to observe her conduct herself in that way and be true to her observations, no matter what the heck anybody else said, uh, really has given me, by proxy, really a lot of that courage that I have borrowed from her. And, and really to not be as nice. I, I'm really very nice. Um, as many of us are who are socialized as women, I'm very, very nice. And, and there are times when being very, very nice is really a bad thing in science, and I learned that directly from her. And then I'm wearing a, a necklace and earrings that are termites. I don't know if you can see those. I had picked those up and intended to send them to her for her last birthday. And unfortunately, I never got the chance, so now it's my uh, job to wear these. Uh, but really, she advocated for all of her students, whether we were summer students like I was or whether we were her own students in her own lab, to really go forth and carve out your own niche and find my own uh, termite hindgut. And so I did, and this is a picture of it, uh, or one of the pieces of the um, global geological hindgut <laughs> that I study. This is um, in Lechuguilla Cave in New Mexico. And um, in the center at the bottom, there's a little person for scale. 
So this is the environment in which I have chosen to explore and to be a substitute for what I really wanted to do when I was a little kid, which was jump in a rocket ship and go cruise the galaxy and look for uh, weird blue things with tentacles that I could like talk to, right? I mean, I fell in love with aliens when I was probably six years old and I've been pursuing them one way or another ever since. And so because rocket ships are really pretty hard to come by now, this is the direction in which I have tried to uh, be true to what Lynn has um, try to transmit, and that is fearlessness intellectually, and to some extent physically, to go into environments to really study what I wanted to study. And I thank her deeply for that. So here's my um, career in a slide. Um, we work on, of course, uh, subsurface geomicrobiology and all of its manifestations. Um, cave microbes are super cool, and they are more complex in terms of their community uh, construction than you would expect if you just thought that they were uh, secondarily derivative from surface soils or something like that. Um, they actually contribute to making caves. They enhance caves that are already there by uh, munching away bedrock and so forth. They have so many different chemical talents that I can't even begin to uh, cover all those even in a semester-long course, which I try to do every couple of years. They make wonderful biosignatures, which means that, of course, they're perfect for uh, future targets for astrobiological investigations. They make a lot of weird compounds, which probably they do because they have to compete with each other as well as collaborate with each other. Um, and <clears throat> they're great at all of these different unusual things, and it's all going on underneath your feet right now, and we see it in caves. But the truth is that the fracture habitat in the terrestrial landmass of Earth is a massive biome, um, and really only appreciated in the last um, decade or two. So that's what I do, all right? But as I, as, I, as I conduct that work, it's very clear that the microorganisms in the Earth's crust are ubiquitous in virtually every low temperature environment, and by that I mean something less than maybe 150 degrees. Uh, C. We don't really know the upper limit to temperature uh, for life um, because it's very hard to study. And the other aspect of the work that jumps out at me constantly is the inextricable nature of the way that the microbial life is tied to the geological history of this planet. You can't even really clearly imagine an abiotic Earth with anything like the properties that it has in the surface, and perhaps even um, affecting some of the processes that go on in the deeper Earth, and certainly the atmosphere and the oceans. So uh, the Earth is a product of that biology influence from its very earliest times. Of course, this is forcing, in some circles, a rethinking of the mineralogy and geochemistry that we bring to Earth science, because it's really hard to imagine um, it going on in an actual abiotic way. And so the more I study these processes, the more I wonder whether there really are any truly abiological processes that are easy to tease out anywhere from the surface down to maybe 10 kilometers, maybe even more. So tying this back to my broad thinking about life in the universe, um, this is the planet that uh, Lynn and Jim Lovelock, of course, um, use as the model for their Gaian ideas. And struggling with this in terms of how we apply this to radically different planets right here in our own solar system and increasingly our ability to see exoplanets outside of our own solar system, where we're getting into the era where we want to uh, biologically interpret those as potential life homes. Here on our planet, we have great sunlight, which drives um, you know, a major photosynthetically um, framed biosphere. It's very easy to see that the gases are not in chemical equilibrium, as Lovelock pointed out very early. Um, and this thing called the critical zone, which in ecology, of course, means you know, the, uh, the relatively near surface atmosphere, the troposphere. Uh, that we breathe and move around in, um, the oceans, the other shallow bodies of water on land masses, and perhaps the first five to per, per, uh, perhaps even 10 kilometers or so 
of the Earth's crust is well mixed. Cycling goes on. Fluid transport of nutrient uh, energy and materials goes on. And so this is the model that we have for Gaia. But we have other planets in our solar system that may be very representative of planets elsewhere, as a matter of fact. And these are two targets that, of course, uh, figure prominently in our thinking about astrobiology. And they're not like Earth. They have no visible means of support on the surface. They're not green or gooey. When you do the analysis of the gases in the Mars environment, it's pretty predictable chemistry. Uh, with some exceptions that may have to do with internal leakiness, um, like the methane uh, measurements that have been claimed. And when you look at this kind of planet, you have to think about the critical zone really in a very different way. You know, we have this top-driven uh, critical zone here, which is photosynthetically driven. But if you imagine a planet like Mars or Europa, you can only imagine that the energetics of that biosphere that might exist on those types of uh, bodies would have to be driven from below. So this is really an inversion of the idea of the critical zone. Um, this also means these are very hard to study because all the good stuff is hidden inside. And this has profound implications for how we go about looking for lives, uh, for life-bearing planets elsewhere in our solar system and beyond. There's another cryptic aspect of life on our planet, and that is what we typically expect is you're either um, uh, verdant and lush and happy and running around and having a lovely life, and so you're extant, or you're old and crunchy and gray and you're buried in the ground and you're extinct. Uh, but the truth is that perhaps it's a more complicated situation. And this gets at what John was just sort of alluding to, which is the, uh, the issue of rare life, that perhaps virtually all or certainly the bulk of organisms that more or less have been invented over time are hanging around at some massively subdetectable level. I think of them as Lazarus, uh, Rip Van Winkle, and The Walking Dead. And trying to analyze that in some of our work, I want to sh just share a couple of things about one of the exam examples excuse me, that we have been looking at. This is a um, beautiful cave system in Mexico uh, near the town of Nica. And there are mining activities there, which is why these caves were discovered. Um, the tiny people are actually normal-sized people. They just happen to be small compared to the scale of the uh, mineralogy in the system. We can actually get in there because it was drained for mining, but it's still saturated humidity, and you can see that the temperatures are exceedingly hot. What drew our attention to this environment was because we have studied similar chemical manifestations of systems like this that still exist in caves that are no longer hot or no longer um, acidic or no longer geologically active. But this was a system in which we believe that there would be um, hidden pockets of microorganisms perhaps preserved, and we got quite an eyeful. The crystal that you see at the top uh, has a fabulously wonderful fluid and gas containing bubble in it, and this was really our quarry, or our main quarry. And we had discovered that there were um, microbial fossil materials in these coated in iron and manganese oxides. And we also discovered, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, that numerous microorganisms are living embedded in the iron oxide and clay walls through the chambers within which these giant crystals are growing. So it's a very active microbial system at relatively uh, high temperatures and dominated by sulfur mineralogy. The results so far are that we have managed to sample uh, inclusions within the crystals that we believe are between 10 and 50,000 years old. We have to sort of calculate the ages of the crystals and we have fairly decent um, age dating on some of those. And we've been able to recover actually quite a lot of DNA that is sequenceable. And more important to me because I'm really interested in, in uh, growing live specimens so I can see what they do in the lab, is that we have 30 mixed cultures of living organisms that have been trapped in these geological materials for at least tens of thousands of years. We suspect that they could last longer. 
The other interesting thing about this environment is that there are many, many viruses present, and viruses don't live by themselves. And so if there are viruses present, uh, this also means that this is a very robust and active uh, microbial system. Of course, we are doing the genetic analysis to try to look at who these organisms are related to. Um, none of them, of course, are uh, known species um, and mostly not even known genera. But there are very interesting aspects to this. That is that I've tried to color code this. You can see that the uh, yellow uh, rings are around specimens that come from other caves, maybe halfway around the world, like Altamira in Spain. Uh, or Frasassi in Italy. Uh, we also have some now that are related to Australian cave organisms. There are geothermal and volcanic representatives uh, in, in terms of their closest relatives and other weird chemistries and soils. So the point of even showing you this is that the heritage of this community within this environment is a gamish of different sources. One of the other interesting aspects, of course, is the overall biodiversity. And one of the things that is surprising to us, but maybe not, maybe we should rethink some of these things, is that the greatest biodiversity we are seeing is in the worst possible places in this cave. Um, an area called hell, for good reason. It's at the 800 meter depth, and uh, there it's about 65 degrees centigrade, and one of my grad students actually got burns on her legs while we were trying to work in there. So the biodiversity is actually increasing as we go deeper and hotter within this system. And you can see that there is a subsurface or a subset a set of biodiversity actually in the fluid inclusions, and that makes sense because they're spatially restricted. So each fluid inclusion seems to be a little sample of the fluid within which these giant crystals were occurring. Well, the point of telling you that, besides being able to show you those fabulous pictures of amazing crystals, and cute bugs, is that really this is one of the examples of entombed longevity, of organisms being able to tolerate geological conditions in the subsurface for geologically and certainly biologically significant periods of time. Now this is a very highly controversial area because a lot of the materials in which organisms have been taken from actually are plastic over time. Ices flow, salt materials flow, but I gotta tell you that selenite, carbon uh, 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 sulfate, calcium sulfate does not flow. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that the organisms that we think are of a particular age in terms of when they were entombed, were entombed then. So what are the consequences of this? Well, one of the questions is how long can you be viable can you survive low temperature diagenesis? That is all the changes that go on when uh, sedimentation occurs. When you look at the closest relatives to a lot of our organisms in these systems, and you find that their closest relatives are marine endosymbionts from the hydrothermal vents, it makes you wonder how long that lineage has actually been in those sediments. I think there's a case to be made for that, and it's gonna be a difficult case to make, and probably not gonna be made by me, but maybe my students, um, maybe your students. This, of course, makes me think about the subsurface really acting as a geological genome bank over geological time. You know, we tend to think things live and then they die and then they become extinct and then they become preserved and new forms are arising or mixing on the surface. But I actually think that there is a recycling mechanism, not just for the geochemistry and sedimentology of the planet, but also for some elements uh, within the microbial community. And this makes the linear tree of descent even messier, I hate to tell you. It's not just lateral gene transfer, but maybe it's guys that are hanging out like Rip Van Winkle for some period of time and then re-emerging. So Earth has a chemically, hydrologically, and biologically well-mixed critical zone. Maybe it also has a geologically and temporally well-mixed critical zone within which organisms can re-emerge at geological intervals. And if this is true, this means that the rare organism aspects to the uh, global biosphere are even more important because they are the backup plan for changes in environmental conditions. 
and might help us explain why we get such rapid recolonization in some cases after uh, major catastrophic events, where organisms seem to appear out of nowhere and then become the dominant form. For example, when Mount Hel uh, St. Helens blew up in, the, in 1980. Uh, within a couple of weeks, the system had gone from a pristine alpine system all the way to being highly populated with a plethora of high temperature organisms living happily in those streams. All I can end on is what does this imply for my category of type two biosphere planets like Mars? Uh, we now know that Mars has a much more complicated climate cycle over geological time than we thought because its obliquity changes. So it isn't just summer and winter and fall and spring on an annual basis. It's a big change in seasons over 100,000 year timescales uh, within which a biosphere can go to sleep and wake up perhaps. And what does this imply for Gaian systems? And this is something that makes me the saddest that I can't call Lynn up now and bounce these ideas off her and have a good old argument. Thank you very much. <laughs>